Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to the 100th episode of Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, during the last 100 episodes, we have brought you many interesting segments from teachings about our faith to reading the Bible and the diary of St. Faustina to meeting many Marian priests and brothers. But perhaps the most popular segment of all is our human interest stories about people living divine mercy in their lives. So for this special episode, our 100th, we thought we would bring you some highlights from some of our most popular episodes based on the number of views. In fact, two of these shows won Tele Awards, which recognize excellence in video and television production. Now, we wish we could show you highlights from all of our episodes because they are all unique and incredible witnesses of divine mercy, but we don't have quite the time. So sit back now and enjoy some uplifting stories of how divine mercy, despite the craziness in our world today, is active in so many ways. We are Here on Living Divine Mercy, we have had stories of healing, both physical and spiritual. First is a Tele Award winning story about four kids in one class in Powamo, Michigan, called the Miracle Kids, who all had rare terminal diseases. But the entire town came together and prayed for them. And wait till you see what happened. Next, we have a story about the famous singer of the Divine Mercy Chaplet that you'll recognize right here on EWTN, who, however, many of you may not know, came very close to dying from kidney failure. What happened next was incredible. And finally, we have the spiritual healing of Zachary King, who was a Satanist and high wizard whose life was changed by one encounter with the Blessed Virgin Mary. So let's take a look at these first three shows. St. Joseph's Catholic School. And here are the Miracle Kids today. Ready to laugh, learn, and look ahead. You might ask yourself, what are the odds of that happening? <laughs> They're only God's odds. <laughs> They're nobody else's odds. It's just such a beautiful thing. To think about you know, these four little kids who all had tremendous health challenges to find themselves in the same little classroom in a little town who all had pretty high-tech care in a town not so far away. I mean, we call these kids the miracle kids, so I'm, which I think is perfect. The phrase, Jesus, I trust in you, is more present now in my life for sure than what it was even before. You know, maybe our, our plans weren't so different after all. God presented us a test on our faith and our marriage and we succeeded. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. We did a lot of praying with her and, you know, ask everybody that we knew. I mean, the community has been so amazing. Um, and just, you know, just start praying. They did, gosh, they did. If that wasn't the hand of God, I don't know what the hand of God is. If that wasn't a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. Know 
Michael Bethe, known to his fans as the man with the voice of an angel. I will. But at the age of 49, Michael was diagnosed with a rare, near fatal kidney disease. After seven years on dialysis, he was told he would need a kidney transplant to survive. But his deep faith played a huge role in helping him to stay positive. When I first found out that I had kidney disease and I was going to go on dialysis, that's when my faith kicked in even more because I knew that God had me. I, and, and I knew that I would get a kidney transplant. I didn't know when, but I knew it. My cup has always been full and running over. Uh, and, it's, and it's because of my faith. Despite Michael's positive attitude, his condition worsened. He spent 10 days in a coma, sustained only by life support. Michael was dying. The word says that, you know, uh, God, he never forsake the righteous. You know, he, he, he loves us so much that he's not gonna let anything terrible happen with us. We're gonna go through a, a season, and to me, that, that was a season. But in 2017, another kidney donor was located. Luann still wanted to help, so she and Michael decided to enter the NFT Emory Donor Exchange Program. It was so exciting to know that someone else would benefit as well. And um, we ended up with 10 people in our, in our swap over four different states. Um, they flew my kidney to South Carolina, flew his in at the same hour from somewhere else, and it was just, just pure excitement. It, it really was. After eight years, Michael was officially off dialysis. He indeed had a new lease on life. All right, come on, girl. Come Through this challenge, Michael and Luann have learned to never take for granted the precious gift of life, and they plan to do all they can to be examples of how to live divine mercy every day. Divine mercy, uh, it makes me think of God's grace daily. Eternal Father, I offer you. I, I don't know how I'd make it a day without God. And, and that prayer, I, I get chills. It just brings us closer to God. Holy God, holy night one, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. It's about His grace for me and by Jesus going to the cross and he shed his blood, you know, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, you know, we're asking God to have mercy on, on us. At 12 years old, this other 12 year old kid, he talked about that he belonged to a group that also thought magic was real. Well, I know magic is real. So I decide that I'm going to join this group. At least I'm going to go and check them out and see what they do. Whereas my parents tell me no to everything I want to do, this place, nothing is off limits. And I'm also I'm on all these drugs. I don't know where to get those. I get them there. The longer you stay in Satanism, the more you see the truth. And I went from being on top of the world to having the weight of the world on my back. You know, I can't do this stuff anymore. I drove to Burlington, Vermont. My first day in town, I got a job and I work at the largest kiosk in the mall. And this woman comes up and she presents that she wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings. And I present her with the perfect pair based on her description. And she agrees that is the perfect pair. And she says, that's fantastic. I've got something for you too. And she reaches in her purse and she pulls out this little cheap, gold-colored piece of tin. And then she says the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. She said, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. She drops it in my hand and I clench my fist around it. My store and my mall completely disappear. I'm standing in a darkened void and it's me and this woman. And she tells me about the magic spell I did last night. And that's of the devil. And I've helped split over 100 churches, and that's of the devil. And I've committed over 100 abortions, and that's of the devil. 
I'm terrified. This woman, this woman is scaring me bad. And she says again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, I knew that was the Mother of God. It had to be a grace by the Holy Spirit. And she smiled at me. And it's a smile that I knew I did not deserve. And she took me by the hand, the hand that had the metal in it. And she turned me around. And Divine Mercy Jesus was standing behind me. And in that instant, I knew I did not sell my soul to the devil when I was 13 years old. I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. And the Blessed Mother told me that my job was to help her end abortion. Wow, healing is always possible with God. Now we want to show you three clips from some amazing inspirational stories that we've had on our show. The first is about Zion Clark. If you haven't seen this man, you are going to be both shocked and inspired at the same time. Next, we had a story in a town in Michigan again that you didn't think could exist today. Yes, over 95% of this town is Catholic and 90% are actually practicing. Just wait until you see what the public schools in this town are like. And finally, we have the inspirational story of Nick Salerno, a young man with MS, but what he has taught others will make you cry. Let's take a look at these next stories. My journey kind of starts just back in Ohio. You know, I was born in the foster care system where I experienced a lot of abuse and pain over the first 17 years of my life, not knowing who my mother is, not knowing my father, just kind of being alone, uh, going through these families that just didn't treat me very well at all. So I turned to the streets and, you know, made, found friends, you know. I uh, ended up running around, getting in trouble, and uh, just kind of started going down this downward spiral. My mom stepped up, took me in, and, just completely turned my life around. You know, she's a very religious woman. She's, uh, she is definitely a huge believer in Christ and she would always pray with me. She would always speak life into me and always drop a whole bunch of knowledge bombs, wisdom bombs. I'm the fastest man on their hands in the world, but at the same time, it also means that my family's winning, my town's winning, and my support group's winning because without them, I wouldn't be here doing this for you guys. I know people that have disabilities, that have disabilities the same as mine, that have disabilities that are more severe than mine, and I see them becoming high-level athletes every day. It's all about how much heart you got and how much work you're willing to put in. I'll tell that to any kid with disabilities. I'll tell that to a kid that doesn't have a disability. My message stays the same. So Zion, how do you feel the role of faith has played in your life? Especially I read about your mom, a, a real lady of faith. Tell us about your journey walking the life in Christ. Uh, my mom always said, just trust the process, trust, trust God's plan. Uh, she always tells me God wouldn't have taken me through troubled waters if I couldn't swim. And that sticks, it sticks with me all the time. And that's why every time I have a big accomplishment, I have any sort of big success. I'm always thanking the big guy upstairs first because in my book, at the end of the day, when, at, when we finally close our eyes for the last time, we're all gonna go see him, we're all gonna be judged by him. So with that, I try to live my life the best way, as good, as peaceful as I can, and to instill love and joy into the world because that's how I feel that he will want us to live our lives. This is Westphalia, Michigan. The farmland here is rich and fertile. And so is this unique community's faith with so many beautiful young families attending mass with their children. Two, two, two! For years, giving glory to God through sport has captured the hearts of those who live here. Faith, family, and Friday nights when the football team is playing, everybody's there. But the community never forgets that faith is what wins, both on and off the field. The faith that you find out here in Westphalia is authentic. The one thing we tend to do sometimes is we have faith on Sunday, but not during the week, but not here. 
our championships, our culture, it's all interwoven with their faith in God. And these kids, they're the ones that are requesting it. No one mandates this. These kids have faith on their own. The faith is just as strong come game time. In fact, student-led prayers of Thanksgiving have a place in the locker room as well. In 2019, it wasn't just the state championship game that the girls' basketball team was thinking about. In fact, they were just as concerned about being able to schedule mass to be celebrated after their victory. Um, we got talking with the parents and we're like, maybe we can ask Father Eric if he could do a special mass for us. Sure enough, we contacted Father Eric and he was like, yeah, I would love to do that. Um, and it was honestly the perfect celebration after a state championship to give that appreciation and glory to God after such a big win and such hard work, it was, it was awesome. This message of mercy is personal and strong. That's what I would like to spend our life doing, is being a part of this message, helping the Stockbridge Marians any way that we can to spread this message. And I think in Westphalia, they found a friend. So in the winter of 1996, Nicholas James Salerno was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was an exciting time. I mean, we just had a new child and about as excited as you could be. I really thought everything was going to be great once we had Nicholas. And, um, you know, we're living the perfect life, I thought. Um, you know, far from it. In August of 1996, during Nicholas's six-month checkup, the Salernos were given a devastating diagnosis about their son. The pediatrician looked at me flatly and said, your baby has cerebral palsy. The Salerno family unit was in place, but for Nancy, she was still terribly distraught about being a special needs mom. One day, God led her to a place where she began the journey to find her faith again. I'd never seen Our Lady in this pose before, and immediately I felt drawn to it. I saw myself in her, and it is of Our Lady sitting on a rock with her head in her hands, and she's crying. And right then and there, I saw myself, that's the pose I've been in, been weeping for my child. A short time later, in the middle of Nick's bathroom floor, God revealed to her that Nick's story is not one of drudgery or despair, but of opportunity and fulfillment. And as I'm kneeling on the floor and I'm taking off his braces, I'm feeling this ray of light come down. It felt like it was a warm ray of light. I just, I just could just feel it. And I was holding his feet and I just heard the feet of Jesus. The feet of Jesus. You are the caretaker of Jesus's messenger. Nick's favorite time to spend with our Lord is just right in front of the crucifix where he has his conversations. And nothing brings more joy to Nick than seeing our Lord. During Easter of 2014, the Salerno's home parish asked Nick to portray the part of Jesus in their annual depiction of the Stations of the Cross. Often people who suffer the most are given the gift of having deeper reliance on God and a deeper spiritual life. They know that to love is to be willing to sacrifice and to do anything for the good of the other. To watch grown men with muscles screaming, spitting, I think it brings home the sacrifice that Christ made for all of us, for the world. Good morning, sweetheart. Looks like you're pretty happy to get up today. Caring for Nick today is a challenge. The routine of critical daily care for the Salernos is anything but normal. Nick requires care incomprehensible to most parents, but Mark and Nancy wouldn't change a thing about caring for their son, who they love so much. I look at it as being a father, and so there isn't any other option. I'm going to do it. So no matter how tough times are, then that, you know, it still needs to be done. And I have a saying on board for Nick, it's like, if you're not tired, I'm not tired. And he's the hardest working person I've ever met. Nick has refused to allow his disabilities to define him. 
he has proven his resilience and perseverance by excelling in a public grade school and college environment. His various awards line the walls in his home and show accomplishments including various 5K, 10K, and full triathlon events. It's been the greatest blessing of my life to be Nick's mom and the mother of his siblings. His birth has brought me closer to Jesus in so many ways and closer to the Blessed Mother. I look at Nicholas as a gift and it's a challenge, but I always thought that we were gonna be teaching Nicholas and Nick's been teaching us. That Zion Clark story was one of my personal favorites and meeting him in California was a lesson for me in hope. Now, we can't forget about the stories of works of mercy, and we've certainly had those too. We have the story of a place in Buffalo, New York, that covers many of the works of mercy in one place. And wait until you hear about one woman whose life was changed because of it. Then we have the touching story of Brother Andre's Cafe, where precious special needs employees will make your day when you come in for a cup of coffee. And finally, we show our friend Nermeen Rubin and what she is doing to end the water crisis in Africa when she was told it is impossible. It's not a soup kitchen. It's not clothing bank. It's not homeless shelter. It's our job to do the works of mercy. What I believe God has us here is to draw souls to him. We take care of those who really didn't know Jesus. On a daily basis, people come in and get clothing, get household goods, and every day, six days a week, we right now, we serve 600 people two meals. So we feed the hungry. We clothe the naked from, you know, babies to 99 years old. Every week, St. Luke provides over 8,000 meals to the hungry in the community and helps clothe over 100 families. It's all free and all possible because of the countless volunteers, as well as the St. Luke's missionaries. Each house have a missionary there is to help the mother, show them how to be a mom to the kids, and you know, to go to work and go to school, and we help teach them little things they need to know. Several years ago, Charlene herself was a mother in need of help. St. Luke's was there. I had three kids and I was struggling and then Amy found a house for me and we've just been there. I mean, what more could I ask for? This woman didn't know nothing about me. My baby in the wheelchair was only five years old when we met Amy and, and I, thank, I thank God every, every single day for me allowing this woman is to come to me and she's, she's like my mom. My mom is living, but Amy gave up her heart. And we got baptized here in 96, me and my sister, her four kids and my three kids. I mean, I was on fire. And ever since then, I love worshiping the Lord. I love the church. I take seriously what St. Faustina said. Jesus says, I want you to be merciful in everything, always to everyone. So why are we here? St. Luke's Mission of Mercy is the beacon of hope that lets all people know that God's mercy is for them. Patrick Fitzgerald is the man behind the cookies at Brother Andre's Cafe in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A ministry of Divine Mercy Parish, Brother Andre's is a gourmet coffee and cookie shop which provides employment opportunities for adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We've discovered probably when he was maybe 11 or 12 that he really liked to bake and he really bake. did a good job helping me in the kitchen. Kitchen. And then when he finished high school when he was 21, he went to a food service program at the community college and he really enjoyed it and did well. After that, we really struggled finding work for him. The only jobs that people were offering him were like in the dish room, Show me. you know, away from where other people were. And Patrick uh, is a real social, sweet, pleasant, pleasant right, person. And we just didn't feel that his true gifts would be shining if shining he was stuck forth. in a dish room. Yeah, shining forth. 
my husband and I talked about it a lot and, and coming up with the idea of starting a coffee shop. Patrick's dad, Mike, met with their pastor, Father Chris, about starting a coffee shop that would allow people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, to share their gifts with the community. They teach me things all the time. Danny taught me how to make all the drinks in the beginning, so it's really fun. Every employee brings their unique gifts and talents to the cafe. Morgan has been at Brother Andre's since the very beginning. Morgan has such a good eye for artistic expression, I feel like. I put together the flower arrangements for the tables every week. I like combining the colors and different types of flowers. It lets me be creative and express myself in new ways. On Wednesdays, employees from Brother Andre's live stream the Chaplet of Divine Mercy on social media. Right now we do the chaplet and chat. We get to sit down and get to really pray and talk and get to know, again, the love of Jesus through this beautiful devotional, through this beautiful prayer. Welcome back, Father Chris. It's always great to see you. It's great to see you, Patrick, and we're super blessed today to have you and Shay and Morgan with Morgan. us to pray the chaplet. Chaplet. Take us off a question. Have mercy on us on the world. Take us off a question. Have mercy on us on the world. So the community at Divine Mercy Parish has really been formed around care for the most vulnerable. It's just really changing perceptions on individuals with disabilities who can work. A lot of the special needs parents that I know are just so excited that something's finally happening for our kids. So check out brotherandres.org for great coffee and cookie subscriptions, or better yet, Stop by the cafe in person next time you're in Pittsburgh and enjoy the company of some of the most Christ-like people you'll ever meet. All of our employees, they bring the love of Christ that resides within them because remember, they are pure grace. There's no sin within them. So if you ever wanna be next to holiness, if you ever really purely wanna be next to the pure love of God and just pure grace, right? There was no water around. I saw women walk for hours and hours and hours getting water and the water was as black as my skirt and they were drinking it without filtering it. I just saw a vicious cycle of poverty with no water. How can they eat? There's no food. It hurt my heart so much. Then that is the reason why I decided to start Water for Mercy to provide a solution. Our whole mission is to provide water, food, and hope. The Water for Mercy team is Innovation Africa for Water, Cultivate for Food, and with Cultivate and Don Bosco, we are providing education. We are now changing these cycles of poverty into bountiful cycles of success. And it touches me when now I go and visit these villagers and I see how they've been able to be so resourceful. And it all starts with one drop of water. They were starting to plant seeds. They were making bricks. They were starting to be motivated. They had water. Now they can have their little gardens and they're growing tomatoes, they're growing okra, and they're feeling good. And that is when I decided to provide a permanent solution, not be on a subsistence level to just survive, but to thrive. That is hope. It always inspires me how one person can make such a difference in the world today, even giving water to an entire continent. Now, on Living Divine Mercy, we didn't always do just stories. We've had some amazing interviews with writers like Vinnie Flynn, theologians like Daniel O'Connor, and even interviews with great bishops like Bishop Cordelione of San Francisco, Bishop Coffey of the U.S. Military Archdiocese, and our own Bishop William Byrne of Springfield, Massachusetts. Then on top of that, we've had some great interviews with Catholic celebrities, such as Mark Wahlberg, the actor, his brother Jim Wahlberg, who fights drug addiction, and movie maker Mel Gibson 
as well as legendary college football coach Lou Holtz of Notre Dame. Let's take a look at some of these. You spend, I think one of the powerful things is you spend every morning, if you can't make daily mass, you're trying to get to at least 10, 15 minutes of personal prayer. Correct? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, I, I do that regardless. That's the, the only way to start my day. I yeah. got my hands on my knees. First and foremost, expressing some gratitude and then just praying for all the things that I need to pray for and people that I pray for and things of that nature. And then for the guidance to, you know, to go out and do yeah. what, uh, what, the, what the big picture expectations are of yeah. me. If you wouldn't mind, share the story, Coach, that uh, you had a fire, a tragic fire in the house. Well, what, what happened is uh, it was June 22nd, 2015. I was awakened at 2.30 in the morning, and uh, the house was on fire. It was hit by lightning. What, what happened in, in the house before it burnt, it, downstairs, she had a whole bookcase of Catholic books, Bibles, etc. When the house burned down, Everything was burnt except the bookcase <laughs> with all our Catholic books. Because what happened? The fire started upstairs, and when the upper floor collapsed, it came up and created a wall against that bookcase. And book, uh, there were maybe 50 books. The books were not burnt. The only thing in the That's house that amazing. was not burnt. And I said, You talk about a miracle. Mel, priests like myself are indebted to you uh, for the Passion of Christ. It was a great catechetical tool. Um, it set a new standard for movies in Hollywood. Um, is there any, can we expect either a re-release of the Passion or anything new, a uh, follow-up to the Passion? Well, there's there's always a re-release, especially during this Paschal season, you know. But, but uh, um, yeah, I'm working on the, on, on a, you know, if you like a sequel on the resurrection. Yes. So it's a... Uh, right. But that's a very, oh, if, okay, the passion was big, but this is like 10 times as big. Really? Well, the subject matter is. Well, true. It's, it's not about 12 hours that, you know, it's, it's, it's big. It's, yeah. it's. Uh, Are you able to tell us when we might be able to see that or expect that? Man, maybe a couple of years. Okay. It's, okay. it's huge. It's like, uh, I can't even begin to tell you what has to go into that. I mean, you know, if you've, you know, you've, you've had years to like yeah. contemplate some of the stuff yeah, and to understand what needs to happen in a film to make it understandable and sort of not preach to the choir. Yeah. It's, it's tricky, yeah. but doable, I think. It's always great to see these well-known Catholics living their faith publicly. Now, unfortunately, it is inevitable in life that we will sometimes face tragedies and misfortune. And when we do, many times it requires us to forgive someone. So we have those stories as well, such as the story of a young student at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, whose life was tragically cut short and his mother faced the difficulty of how to forgive. Then we have the story of Sammy Wood and the loss of her daughter, Claire, to suicide, which along with my own grandmother's suicide inspired my book, After Suicide, There is Hope for Them and You. And finally, we all heard about the tragedy of the shooting at Virginia Tech back in 2007. But the story of a mother of one of those heroes that day will show you the true meaning of forgiveness. Brian wanted to be a doctor. He wanted to be a pediatrician. He wanted to help children. He was really excited because he was going to be living off campus for the first time. I said, well, that's good, honey. You know, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. He said, okay, Mom. I said, I love you, Bri. He said, I love you too, Mom. And none of us knew that he only had a few hours left to live. We decided to go back to the police station to see if anybody had heard anything. And in walked a brand new police officer. And he came over to us and kind of crouched down in front of me. And he said, Mrs. Miha, we've been looking for you. We just got word. They found Brian. 
And I said, and he's alive. And he said, no. Forgiveness is an act of the will. It's definitely not an act of our feelings. Our feelings are fickle. Our Lord in the garden, he didn't act on his feelings. He did not want that cup. But he united his will with his Father's will and still suffered. So an act of forgiveness means to refuse to have any ill will towards someone who has hurt us and to have good will towards them, to pray that they know God and go to heaven. Well, God asks a lot of us when he asks that. But we have to do it. It's not optional. And I said the words out loud. I said, I forgive these men. And God gave me at that moment a great gift. He gave me what I can only call at that moment the peace of heaven. It was like a calmness in the midst of this great suffering. And if I hadn't forgiven, would would anything that came after have happened? Brian, he really liked the one night he had in that house. So we were able to buy that house and take the evil that had happened in it and turn it into something good. Franciscan University students live in that house free of charge. We wouldn't have done that without that act of forgiveness. The fruits of forgiveness didn't stop there. Rachel felt a call to reach out and do more for children living in the inner city. What started in a church basement years ago has grown into an after-school and summer program that has enriched the lives of hundreds of children. And so we started the Brian Muha Foundation, we call it the Run the Race Center and the Run the Race Club. And now children come after school, in the summer, anytime to have a safe place to be, to be surrounded by people that love them. So it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. The next day, a gunman killed 32 people at Virginia Tech. Matthew charged at the shooter and attempts to save his fellow classmates. When my son died, I said, I could live another 30 years. How do I want to live it? And I had to make a decision. Do I walk towards God or do I blame him for everything that happened and walk away? I felt the best way that one could heal would be to forgive. And I forgave the shooter. I just felt that with forgiveness, love, and mercy, that it would be very healing for me. And I think that also lifts a big burden from you and you're free to smile again, you know, to embrace life. But behind her smile, Claire was living in a secret world that she thought she couldn't tell anyone about. Battling health issues and problems at school, the hidden anxieties she thought she couldn't share finally came together both mentally and emotionally in a perfect storm. Then I had gone out and I had taken my walk, said my rosary, said my Divine Mercy Chaplet. When I walked back in, she said, what were you doing, Mom? And I said, well, I went out to pray my rosary and a Divine Mercy Chaplet. She said, why do you do that? I said, for whoever dies today. And she just kind of listened. And, and then the last thing we had with her is I came in here, she was laying on the couch, that couch right there, and uh, she was just quiet, and I said, baby, I know, I know you're sad and worried about school starting tomorrow. It'll be okay, it'll be okay. And I, I made the sign of the cross over her forehead and told her I loved her. And that's the last time that I saw her alive. She snuck out of the house. She um, went up to the barn and she died by suicide up there. We didn't know. My dad came rushing in later because they had heard the sound from their house. He came in and said, Claire's dead. Claire shot herself. Claire's dead. Ran up there and knelt by her. It was going to start raining. The clouds were building. It was a lot. Picked her up. Her daddy and I picked her. 
I don't know how to pray at that moment. I don't know how to pray. But what I do know is that my only hope is to run to the Blessed Mother and to run to Jesus because it's too big. This, this tragedy is too big to exist without God. How in the world could this be? How in the world could this be? As a family, we couldn't, we couldn't stay together for what, how broken we were. We couldn't stay together if we didn't have God in the center of it, clinging to Him and clinging to the things that the Blessed Mother taught us at the cross. You just beg Mary to give you her faith and her trust and her hope because she had that. She had all those beautiful things that you have to have. Now you have to have. My tears don't mean we don't think we have hope. All our hope and trust is in God. But it brings tears because we miss her and we love her. And we will always miss and love her, always. Wow, until we are actually in those situations, we never know how we could forgive and actually bring a greater good from such tragedies as these ladies have experienced. Next, we know that God doesn't leave us abandoned, and He will many times intervene to save lives. The first story we have in this segment is about a woman who went to have an abortion. But the words of one lady who was praying there that day changed everything, leading her to choose adoption. And wait till you see what happened when she met her son almost 20 years later after she gave him up for adoption. We've also had other amazing stories of healing and abortion like Dina Pasillo and others who have found Christ's divine mercy to be the healing antidote. Then we had the story of two women who had the courage to adopt and help children and orphans in China. Please note the little girl in that story who was missing a leg. It is heartbreaking, but seeing what these ladies have done is truly inspiring. Finally, we have the story that became a major motion picture starring Tom Hanks called Sully about the airliner that went down in the Hudson River but no lives were lost after one man prayed the chaplet of divine mercy. I basically moved in together with my high school sweetheart and we got pregnant and it was not planned. We uh, were in a situation where we would go a few days without eating and we would go to his mom's house sometimes just to, to get food. And we didn't feel it would be appropriate to raise a child in an environment when we couldn't even feed ourselves, let alone a child. The quickest solution at that time was, let's go somewhere and get the abortion before it becomes a bigger problem. And they came to me and they put a blanket over my head and I was being, you know, called names and people were yelling at me. Some were pleading with me. Some were praying that I not go in there. But this one lady stood out above everything. And I heard her say so clearly, your baby has 10 fingers and 10 toes. Please don't kill it. And I lay my head back down and I keep hearing that voice in my head, your baby's got 10 fingers and 10 toes, please don't kill it. And my head falls to the right again. And all of a sudden, I hear this man's voice. And it was plain as day as I'm looking at you right now. And it says, get up, get up. It's not too late. And seconds later, the doctor walks in. He comes in, he washes his hands, he puts his gloves on, he sits on this little silver stool, slides over to me, and goes like this, hitting the stirrups, and right as his hand brushed up against my left leg, I said, I can't. I set up, I said, I can't, I can't do this. So he stands up, he rips his gloves off, turns around, starts heading out the door, puts his right foot on the trash can, drops his gloves in, and never looks back at me. 
I so badly wanted to say to somebody, anybody, I didn't do it. I, I, I'm so pregnant. But I was scared, young, naive. So I just got in my car and we drove off. Still pregnant. I got connected with a social worker. So I told her my story. And I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And she looked at me and she said, have you ever thought about adoption? I went home, talked about it for a little bit, thought it over, spoke with the birth father, and we agreed that that would be the best route for us to go. And I talked to my husband and I said, okay, he's well willing to meet, but he wants to bring a film crew to do this. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he goes, but babe, what if it saves even one person? Is it not worth it? God has got big plans for you. When the van pulls up, like I'm literally pacing my living room floor back and forth. Like I'm so anxious. I've waited 19 years at this point and I am going to hug my birth son since the first day he was born. I am going to see what he looks like. I run out and as he's walking up, I'm like darting out my front door and I just latch onto him and I didn't want to let go. We went actually through an orphanage and it just changes you in a way that I can't even describe to you to see rows and rows and rows of cribs with babies who don't even cry or reach out for anyone because they know no one's going to be there. They're just almost dead inside because their needs aren't met. One girl that we met, um, she was missing the lower part of her legs right here. And so I assumed she was born like that. What had happened that the orphanage had become so cold that they didn't have, and they didn't have the money for the um, coal that was needed to heat the orphanage. And so this girl got such bad frostbite that they had to amputate. And it was just so incredibly sad. And she said it would have cost $400 to heat the orphanage that month, only $400. So I just looked at her and I said, this will never happen again. Anne and Michelle took their commitment even deeper, adopting the unadoptable, bringing into their own homes children born with special needs or with addiction issues from substance abusing parents. Anne admits that at first she and her husband were worried. Michelle has nine children, four of them adopted from China. And of those, three have special needs. Anne has two biological children and has adopted 14 children, with all of the adopted ones having special needs. The children often help with in his hands. And Anne also takes the younger kids still living with her to volunteer at her church's food pantry. That comes with the territory, she says, of learning about Christ. If everyone that was able to take care of an orphan would step in and do it, there would be no more orphans. So I immediately looked out my window. I was in seat 16A, which is window seat on the left side of the plane, and could see flames coming out of the left engine. And as a private pilot, I knew that that meant that that engine had failed. And I felt okay because I thought that the other engine would certainly be working. There was no sound of the engines. You could hear the, the wind uh, it was very strange. We began to descend below the skyline, the tops of the buildings. And of course we were nowhere near an airport. We were going into the river. Okay, which runway would you like at Cedarboro? Can't do it. We're going to be in the 
the singular announcement was made by Captain Selby that um, this is the captain brace for impact. At that point, that was all that was said. Before the uh, plane crash, I had really made a commitment to myself to go deeper, I guess, in my faith commitment and journey. So I was reading more. I was trying to devote more time to meditation and prayer and was really more committed. And that day, by happenstance, I was able to go to mass, which is really unusual, which was fortunate. And I had prayed the uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet recently before, which was not normally a, a prayer that I would normally pray. And so what that spoke to me as we were going down, I, I thought, well, OK, this, this might be it. Maybe, may, maybe this was preparation. After the crash, Fred reached out to a friend of the Marians, Vinny Flynn, who became a friend to Fred as well. I had just purchased his a book that he wrote. And on the, on the flight, as we were waiting to take off, I opened up his book and started reading it. So it literally, I thought that might be the last book I ever read in my life. And after that event, I just reached out to him and thanked him and said, I was literally reading your book when I heard the left engine uh, implode on the aircraft that I was on. Thank you for your book. See, God is always in action, saving lives and souls. And finally, we have the stories that bring the most important parts of our faith together, prayer and the sacraments. My favorite pastime, football, is also our other Telly Award-winning show about an assistant coach with the Denver Broncos who shares his faith through the rosary with other NFL professionals. And last but not least, we don't want to forget about the circus when it comes to town. So we finish with a circus chaplain who is a priest who brings to the circus workers what is truly the greatest show on earth, the Mass. All right! Today is day seven of Denver Broncos training camp for the upcoming National Football League season. Ben Steele is the assistant offensive line coach for the Denver Broncos. He learned that prayer was a way to reduce stress and help make good decisions. He learned that faith and football could go together. Without question, faith and football fit together. It takes discipline to be a football coach and be a football player. It takes even more discipline to be consistent in your faith as a Catholic day in and day out. You either get better or you get worse, and it's no different in our faith. And I'm always growing as a Catholic, and I'm never going to stop growing. Ben wanted to follow in the footsteps of those who inspired him. So he and his daughter Cora teamed up to make their own rosaries. You know, they say that the rosary is linked from uh, earth to heaven. And if I'm giving these out to our offensive linemen, we have offensive linemen that are 340 pounds. These gotta be strong. I started giving them to coaches and players and other different people on, on staff that I worked with. My whole reason for starting to make these rosaries was um, to show the power of our faith that can be passed on as a weapon of our faith against evil. When I see, um, you know, coaches and players in the locker room before games and they're praying the rosary that I gave them, I'm like, oh, we got a chance. He's the national circus priest, and his flock, ever on the move, stretches from coast to coast. For of the more than 300,000 circus workers in the U.S., some 50% are Catholic. And this ministry is an answer to a cryptic remark Father Frank once heard from a circus-going spectator after he had introduced himself to her. And, and so I told her what I did, and then she said this to me, why do people like this need someone like that? 
But the answer should not surprise you. They're religious and spiritual people. They're grounded in this notion of something bigger than themselves, which always gives us something to be able to kind of uh, uh, work off of. Father Frank joined a circus ministry that has existed in the Catholic Church for 125 years and has numbered among its most avid supporters both Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul. It's something that always amazes me that uh, we are so appreciated on, on the shows and when they know we're coming, it's, it's, people are excited. It's an important keystone to, to performers' lives. So to wrap up this 100th episode, we want to thank President Doug Keck and all at EWTN who allow us Marian Fathers to bring these amazing stories of divine mercy to you. In addition, I want to thank our incredible staff, led by producer Mary Clark, our own lovable cameraman Giuseppe, Brother Mark Fanders for his extraordinary technical talent, Hope Hansen, who helps coordinate the stories, and our other technicians, such as Dale Zavater, Matt O'Neill, Gus Rodriguez, George Foster, and all of our production teams here at the Marian Fathers and at EWTN. So please keep tuning in, as we hope to bring you the next 100 amazing episodes of Living Divine Mercy. And remember, these are just short clips, so to see the full versions, as well as all the other 100 episodes, please go to EWTN's on-demand website or visit us at divinemercyplus.org. And until next week, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.